Hello everyone to today's little broadcast. Hopefully it will be little as I tend to talk a little bit. But uh, welcome to our continuing study of the Old Testament and the Pearl Great Price, uh, which is a companion book to the book of Genesis. It consists of the books of Moses and Abraham, and it is a Latter-day Saint scripture, uh, which was translated by inspiration by the prophet Joseph Smith, the first prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, I was reading in the book of Moses, chapter 6, verse 6 today, and, and one verse that has... Uh, attracted my attention. I spent my whole career working with language. So anything that has to do with language always attracts my attention. And so verse 6 of Moses 6 said, it talks about Adam and Eve having more children and they now have writing and they have reading. We have, we don't have any idea how that emerged, how writing and reading emerged but um, that's a topic for another another little video but a book a book of Rem in verse 5 a book of remembrance was kept it says a book of remembrance was kept in which was recorded in the language of adam for it was given unto as many as called upon god to write by the spirit of inspiration so anyone who's called by god is writing by a spirit of inspiration and verse 6 and by them their children were taught to read and write having a language which was pure and defined uh, and undefiled so they are writing in this pure language now those two verses writing by the spirit of inspiration we know that the spirit of inspiration is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Whenever you're testifying of the Savior, you are writing by the spirit of inspiration. Whenever you're trying to teach your children about, about the Savior and his atonement, you're teaching and educating by the spirit of inspiration. Um, so the language was pure and undefiled. And I don't know if that refers to a pure, easy grammar or you know, some some form of super language that's easy to learn and and write in. Um, we don't know what that what that, what form that language took, but we know that it was pure and undefiled, uh, which I assume means it was easy to communicate with, easy to understand, um, easy to express things in. And that made me think, this verse made me think about the plan for this year, about, about reading the scriptures, reading the Old Testament, reading the, the Tanakh, the, the Jewish word for the Old Testament. Well, the Tanakh basically refer, is the, an abbreviation that's vowed and refer, refers to the Torah, which are the five books of Moses, Navim, the books of the prophets, and Ketuvim, which are the books of wisdom and, you know, the books of wisdom and uh, the books of history. So Torah, Navim, Ketuvim, that's the Tanakh. Now, I know that in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and in many churches, uh, we are huge fans of the King James Version. And I love it. It's a classical work. It's, it's inspiring. But I believe that if we are to understand the spirit of, of the scriptures, if we are to understand the manner of expression among, among the Jews, if we are to understand... Uh, the Old Testament, then we need to read it from a Jewish perspective. And that includes reading it in a translation uh, that is done by Jews. And so my favorite is the Jewish Publication Society's copy of the Tanakh. Now there is one that is much bigger that comes with a commentary. I have it in a digital format. 
but this is the copy I I read from. Um, it has it has a lot of a lot just differences in the translation that I wouldn't say are differences as much as they are clearer translations, and that's why I was thinking of pure and undefiled. The Translators of the King James Version, even though they were translating, I believe, by inspiration, I think they don't think they had access to the same resources that we have today. The whether documents that were unearthed just in the 50s, the 1950s and the 40s and early 20th century. So those those discoveries add clarity to scriptures that the, the translators of the King James Version didn't have. And there is more, I'd say, more objectivity in modern scripture translation, more, more I'd say, scientific approach to translation amongst modern translators that didn't exist amongst the translators of the King James Version, uh, not to mention the level of their knowledge of the ancient languages and the tools that they had access to. So nothing about them personally or their education, but they didn't have access to the same tools and knowledge that we have today. Uh, whether inspiration compensated for that i can't i can't tell i'm sure i'm sure given the prominence of the king james and how it touches people's lives i'm i'm pretty positive that it inspired it it, it was an inspired inspired but again reading the reading the old testament from jewish eyes is is a fantastic way of understanding understanding the jewish point of view now that's the first first topic I wanted to address tonight. The major thing that I wanted to talk about tonight was um, I was reading the again different translation. Uh, there is a book of commentary called. It's based on the New International Version, the NIV translation of the Bible in English, and it's they have a commentary book called the Cultural Background Study Bible. Uh, bringing to life ancient world of scripture. So it's it's a fantastic it's a fantastic work. Has articles by scholars, elaborating on you know the the scriptures, Old and New Testament. But let me share with you. They have an article in the book called "Major Background Issues from the Ancient Near East," and that 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 list it's a list of twelve things that resonated with me. And I'm not going to go into all of them in detail. I'm just going to mention them and make a few comments about some of them. So basically, the the, the article starts from the premise, which we all know. We've all suffered that the Old Testament it comes from an era from an epoch of history that is different culturally completely than us. Now as a Middle Easterner, as a Middle Easterner, I'd say culturally I still identify with some of the things that I, I read in the Bible just because my culture is, is still in some aspects back there. Um, but for a Western reader, Many of these issues do not do not resonate. So let me just go through this list because it's it's fantastic. And again, this is from the uh, New International Version translation of the Bible, the NIV commentary, a book called Cultural Background Study Bible. Now the first the first point they call the Great Symbiosis, and basically it says. In the ancient world, the ancient people in the ancient world believed that gods had made people as slave laborers because they are tired of growing their own food and taking care of their own needs. So they created people to take care of them and pamper them. And um, this point is important because when monotheistic religions, especially a religion like Judaism, came about, it talked about Yahweh, he was an all-powerful, he has all of these super attributes where he has no needs. He has no, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, he has no needs. So culturally, the God of Israel was completely different than the gods of the ancient Near East in that regard. He, he had no needs, he, 
uh, didn't need the people to be slaves. He created people free. So that was a completely new perspective. People were not slaves to God in that sense. People were made to worship God. So this is a very important point to keep in mind when, when we study the Old Testament this year, specifically the Old Testament. Now, the other point which is very important for us as Latter-day Saints is about the presence of God in sacred space. So basically, this is about uh, space being sacred, where God lives. And so that's where temples are, where temples come into the picture. Uh, people of the ancient uh, world created these sacred spaces for their gods to live in. Now we know the Jews were not different in that regard. They had this, they they had the tabernacle in the wilderness for forty years, but uh, later on they built they built a temple, and they believed that only people who like the people of the ancient world they believed that only people who lived in the vicinity of the temple were people who are holy and cold and and special and so and they also believed that you know beyond that sacred space god did not really care for anyone else not because he was disinterested uh, but because that was a sacred space and in the book here it says their needs were all that mattered Israel took its sacred space very seriously, but Yahweh was a very different sort of God. Now, the third point is about gods in community. So this is I, this was important to me when I read it because it talks about the attributes of God. So in the polytheistic world of the ancient Near East, where people worshipped many gods, um, the... the one's identity was found in community. I mean, in the Middle East, it's still the same way. You know, you, you, you are in families and tribes and clans. Those things, those things ma matter. So community matters. People matter. So the gods who take care of that community should were believed to have different attributes to help people in the community uh, according to their needs. So the blacksmith had his own god or her own god or his his own God. Uh, the writer had his own God. If the uh, wife had her own God. And, and you know, so there, there was this constellation of gods taking care of everything. In ancient Judaism, in Judaism, the problem the, of multiple gods was resolved by having a God with multiple attributes. And so that was sort of a reconciliation a reconciliation that Judaism came up with. And we see the same thing in Islam, um, where God has 99 names, 99 attributes. Each one of them have to do with uh, a specific thing, a specific power, attribute, service that God renders to humanity or to the community. Um, the fourth point had to do with revelation and appearances of God, theophanies, you know, the, do gods appear to people? And the people of the ancient Near East didn't believe that in the need for God to appear to people. They believed that, um, you know, gods manifested themselves in the creation of the sun, moon, planets, stars, all of these things. And they... So they made all of these images to express to express God. To uh, so the image was not God; it was a manifestation of God, as the book here says, and therefore it was capable of serving as a mediator for the presence of deity. Um, so those images, those graven images, mediated between man and God. Now, the Israelites were totally different in that regard, as we all know. They didn't believe that there was mediation that was necessary between uh, man and God. And so there was no need for those graven images. Um, the fifth point is about a spirit world. It's about um, demons and servants of the gods and creatures of chaos. 
uh, fallen angels and that sort of stuff. Uh, the in people in the ancient Near East believed in that. Even in the modern modern Near East and the modern Middle East and Islam, who, you know, there is it's a part of the religion. They believe in in demons and they call them jinnis and there is there is that belief and it still exists and so the old testament doesn't talk about these chaos creatures it doesn't it doesn't mention them later on in the new testament we're going to learn about evil spirits creatures of chaos but um not in the old testament there is probably a couple of mentions about familiar spirits but that's all and then the sixth point that the book made and I thought was very good is about the natural versus the supernatural. Uh, in the ancient world, they didn't have, nowadays in, in our modern world, we tend to think of something, if it happens and we have no explanation to it or for it, uh, we, we call it supernatural. Uh, in the ancient uh, world, they didn't, they didn't, uh, you know, speak of miracles necessarily or supernatural. Uh, they spoke of signs and wonders, signs and wonders. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, that's also very important to know. I mean, when we, when we read, when we read the Old Testament and we read about the many uh, miracles that happen, like the, women who can't give birth to children who have children uh, or a donkey that talks one of my favorite stories these are signs and wonders uh, that somehow work by the will will of god um, now point seven that the book makes uh, relates to this point and let me just uh, read read uh, what they say here because I really like it. In the ancient world, people considered events as a small slice of reality that transcended events of history. What we call their mythology was more real to them than their history. When ancient people talked about events, they often found the most significant reality in what God and the gods had done, not in what people had done. Now, why is this important? This is important because... Um, when we read, for example, the creation account, which we've been reading and we're still reading this this week, uh, people, I mean, we talk, we, I, I believe I spoke in the first broadcast about uh, creation, the creation story being available in other mythologies and other stories from cultures of the Near East. And an ancient Israelite would have had the, the writers of the scriptures, the prophets, would have had no problem including uh, some elements of mythology from the cultures around them to help the people understand the story of creation. So mythology was very important, had a power. It was their form of storytelling. So it's... It's very important. This is, I, I thought this was a very important point uh, where the mythological is mixed with the real. And we'll see this in the, in the Old Testament. Again, going back to the story of the donkey, uh, did the donkey talk? Uh, I don't know. Uh, God can do anything. But it probably was used as an illustration based on some story that was being told about talking animals. We don't know, but there is there is power in there of mixing mythology and reality. It's a character of, of those texts. Now, um, the eighth point has to do with creation and order. And I spoke about this in the first uh, broadcast about order and symmetry, where the cosmos starts with unorganized matter that is a sort of chaos, and Moses is showing us that God is, is powerful because he's the only one who can reverse entropy, who can reverse chaos and create order out of chaos, out of disorganization. So the, the Gods were a source of order, and that is a very important point that writers of scripture emphasize. They always bring things back to order, and 
that's why the Savior, you know, it's, it's very important to remember that with the atonement, with his atonement, he brought order back to the universe. By crushing Satan, we bring order back to the universe. So this is, this is a point uh, that's very important. Now, the point nine that the book makes is religion and magic. So there was lots of magic in the name of deities of the ancient world. And this is important. Um, and you'll see why in a second here. So the way that you invoke magic in the ancient world usually is by mentioning the name of the deity, by repeating it, by mixing it, by inscribing it on things. And it, it was believed to be powerful magic, names of deities. And so, um, when Judaism came along, we know that we shall not take the Lord's name in vain. That is one of the commandments. You do not take the, uh, the name of the Lord in vain. You do not repeat it. You do not use it. And throughout the scriptures, throughout, uh, throughout the Old Testament, specifically throughout the Tanakh, there is the name of God is sacred. The name of God is sacred. The Jews never mention the sacred name. They never say Yahweh. It's always, you know, El Shaddai, Hashem. Um, you know, uh, when they, even when they try to write the word God, they write it with G-D. They never fully spell it. So that is... You know, that basically was supposed to end magic. Uh, Judaism uh, was supposed to be a religion like, unlike the other religions around it in that regard. Now, um, then there is this matter of death and memory. So, let me see here. I wrote down what was interesting about this one and my computer screen is taking a minute to come up here and so so people believed believed as and this is this is intuitive people in the ancient world believed believed in life in life after death Judaism was uh, was no different people wanted to be remembered uh, now the way the way for example the pharaohs handled that was by building pyramids you die into a pyramid you build it lasts for 5000 years people see it people remember your name now amongst the amongst the jews for example what you do what you did posterity was really important posterity was very important and as we will see shortly in the stories about Isaac and Jacob and Abraham. The story repeats and repeats and repeats about the woman who is barren, who cannot have children. And then there is the sign and wonder of having a child. That is, that is very important because that's how you build, how you build a name. And whereas the, and this is very significant when we think about uh, people like Abraham and you compare him to many of the kings of the ancient world. Um, you know, many of us wouldn't even know the name of, you know, Nebuchadnezzar or Ramses or any of those kings. Many people don't even know who these people are, but everyone knows who Abraham was. And the reason, the reason we do know who Abraham was is because Abraham was promised in the covenant, in the Abrahamic covenant, he was promised children who outnumber the sands of the sea and that is his monument that is how Mo, how abraham is remembered he is remembered through his posterity so having posterity was extremely important to be remembered so that's why we will have things like polygamy in the old testament that's why marriage and stories of marriage and having children and even sex and all of the stories that we have to do with having children are important because they having posterity is the method by which people were memorialized, were remembered. It wasn't. It's important. It's a it's a basic human urge and need 
to be remembered, to leave a legacy, we call it nowadays. And so that's that's very important. Now, um, we have two points. The last two points is about identity and community and then the retribution principle. And so, again, community is very important. Uh, you do things not by choice necessarily, but because it's a part, you, you become a part of community uh, by doing them. So if your clan adopts a God, you adopt that God, you, it becomes your God. Uh, so that's why it was important, for example, when... Uh, when Jacob, when the Israelites met other people, it was important for those people to make covenants. For example, and we will talk about the story of the rape of Dinah at some point, but those people went through mass circumcision for a reason, because they wanted to become one family, one community, and submitting to circumcision was the way of doing that it was that's why killing those those men despite of the horrible crime they committed was a very horrible and horrific thing it's because they agreed to join with 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 the uh, with the israelites as with the israelites as family and you know, they were betrayed and they were killed by the sons of Jacob. So that is, that is what, you know, point 11. And then there is a retribution principle, which I believe they saved the best for last on that list, which is simply that when you are prospering, it's because you've done something to please God, the gods or God. And when you've done something bad, it's because when you're not prospering, when you're you know, having some problems, it's because you have done something to anger God. Now, you read the Psalms, and it's all over the, the book of Psalms, the Psalms of David. And you'll see it, you know, throughout the stories of the Old Testament, the retribution principle. Uh, you're rewarded when you're being good by God. You're, uh, you're uh, punished when you do something bad. Now, as the NIV cultural backgrounds book points out, the book of Job nuances this view a little bit, but it is the dominant view in the Bible. So this is sort of longer than I anticipated it would be. As I said, I tend to chat and maybe chatter a lot, but these are, these are very important 12 points. Uh, again, it's very important for us to understand, have a little bit of understanding about the culture. And I, I, when, I read, when I read that list in the NIV Cultural Backgrounds book, uh, it struck a chord and I thought I should share it. And again, uh, I highly recommend it if you're reading the Old Testament this year, and we haven't started yet because we're still processing Moses and Abraham and the Pearl Great Price with little parts of Genesis, but if you can go out and get the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, by the Jewish Publication Society, it's it's worth it. It's a it's a good thing to read from this year because it will it will be like reading the Old Testament in new eyes. The language is a little more modern and easier, and I highly highly recommend it. And if you want to sort of treat yourself more just by the Tanakh with the commentary by the Jewish Publication Society. It's it's very, very useful. Anyway, uh, that's it for tonight, and I hope all of you will be blessed, and thank you for spending all this time with me, and I say this in Jesus' name. Amen.